Everybody for tuning in again. Uh, this is the second in our um, series of uh, Maritime Trade Route series. Uh, if you tuned in last week, you would have seen Dr. Um, Marina Canetti and her talk. Um, and tonight we have the respondent to her talk, um, uh, Professor Tim Winter. And um, just to make things fair, we're going to let Marina respond to Tim this time. So this is so, sort of a, a, a two-part um, a two-part series, really. And as I said last week, this is really in the run-up to our um, maritime uh, China and the Maritime Silk Roots uh, Symposium, which is happening uh, Friday week, so the 21st to the 23rd of August, where we'll be covering a lot of these topics in a lot more depth. So if you haven't signed up already, do, do please uh, join us for that. Um, so without further ado, let me uh, introduce the two speakers again, and then I will hand the floor over to, um, to Tim. Uh, professor Tim Winter is the ARC prof uh, prof professor, for professor, sorry, professor Future Fellow uh, at the University of Western Australia and author of Geocultural Power, China's Quest to Revive the Silk Roads for the 21st Century. Uh, and futuresilkroads.net is his uh, website. Um, the respondent tonight is Professor Marina Canetti. She is at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, National University of Singapore, and her research focuses on the intersection between visuality, governance, and power. So without any further ado, I'll hand the floor over to Professor Winter, please. Thank you. Thanks, um, Stephen. Hopefully um, everybody can see my screen. If not, um, just give me a shout. Um, okay, I'd like to start naturally um, thanking Stephen and Denise for organizing this uh, webinar series. It's a fascinating set of discussions, and I think we'll be um, developed into a fascinating conference at the end of next week. Um, tonight, um, I'm going to connect to some recent developments that are happening um, uh, in, a, in a sort of broader public domain around the ways in which um, the politics of memory and history seem to be um, entering public debate in different countries and in different regions. We've seen this feature into elect electoral politics in the US and debates around social justice and memory. The Black Lives, Latter, Black Lives Matter movement and the Roads Must Fall movement have both raised awareness of the importance of our history is represented and commemorated. And what happens when complex histories consolidate around certain heroes and stories? So today I also want to look at what role history plays in the present by examining a term that's gaining rapid currency or rapidly gaining currency, and that is the Maritime Silk Road. But instead of talking about individual monuments, I want to look at a much bigger scale and offer you a much bigger, broader picture that incorporates many locations, many actors, and some powerful forces that are, up, that are at play today. So in Asia, across the region, history and heritage have become multi-million dollar industries in the last couple of decades. This is being driven by tourism, city making, and so forth. It's also central to the identity making uh, politics of the region. And often this gravitates around the nation state and that's received an, a, an extensive body of critical work within academia in the recent uh, 25 years or so. It's a process that's also been given prestige by organizations like UNESCO and others who are in, involved in this sector. But current developments are forcing us to look beyond the national towards the regional and how to interpret what is happening. What questions do we need to ask? What connections do we need to make to interpret what's going on today? So to begin to answer that question, I think we can actually go back in time because the late 19th century and what happened in regions such as the Middle East offers us a useful guide for understanding uh, what, may be, what may be at stake today. So the, so the image you see there is of the Palestine Exploration Fund, a British organization of archaeology ostensibly that was surveying um, the Levant and the Holy Lands that became uh, geographies of the Bible, archaeology or biblical archaeology of the late 19th, early 20th century. So looking back at that period, we now have a much better understanding of the links between the writings of history, the role of archaeology therein, the ambitions of imperial powers and the securing of influence of territories that came through infrastructure. We also have a much better understanding of the role of disciplines such as archaeology that have played into that space and, and books like this have helped to reveal those connections. Um, but what we also uh, have got a sense of is the roles in which the ways in which um, archaeology has played uh, played a, played a role in the construction of civilizational discourses. 
and the ways in which they were fashioned within particular political and ideological contexts, namely empire, whereby the processes of the peoples of the world were placed in hierarchical categories of race and religion and culture. And I would suggest it's to such, uh, sorry, that's moving too fast. I would suggest it's to such uh, histories that we need to look to, to ask some questions about, to interpret what's happening today and pay critical attention to the forces that shape how the past is being written and rewritten and then represented. So as Marina showed, the heritage boom in Asia is now turning to the seas and the oceans. And I would argue that Belt and Road is a key driver of this. It's a project that was launched in 2013 and it's a project of continental connectivity across multiple sectors. As I think we all know, it's, a, it's been branded as, a re, as the revival of the Silk Roads for the 21st century. And I'm sure you're all familiar with these types of images that uh, appear in journalistic uh, publications, uh, think tank reports and academic publications that um, speak to a history of, of this revival of the Silk Roads for the 21st century. Sorry, my slides are behaving erratically. Um, um, and uh, as I say, this is presented as, as the revival of the Silk Roads of the 21st century, which is giving, um, which is giving, sorry, this is uh, frustrating, um, which is giving uh, um, new impetus to cultural sector collaboration projects within the architecture of Belt and Road. What we've seen in the last few years since 2013 um, is the rise of film festivals, mayor's forums, uh, cultural sector projects across archaeology, museums, heritage, theatres, so on and so forth. It's very much about celebrating the story of the Silk Road. Um, I've looked at this in relation to the broader agendas of Belt and Road and examined this in the context of a book that was published last year. And arguing in that book that we need to look at the Silk Roads as one of the most rec globally recognisable and compelling geocultural forms of the modern era. And that through its mobilization within a grand architecture of foreign policy, that is Belt and Road, we need to understand that the BRI is not just a geopolitical and geoeconomic project, but also a geocultural project too. I won't get into the arguments of that now, but I want to give you some sense of, of the themes that are explored in that book tonight. So as part of the research for that project, it involved examining what is the Silk Road and what are, what are its origins. It's a highly confusing narrative of history and ambiguous and enigmatic. And often people don't really have a greater understanding of what it actually represents, but beyond a broad idea that it's a history of connectivity between East and West or within Asia. It was invented in the, in the late 19th century, as I'll soon explain, but it's been subsequently expanded in terms of the themes it incorporates, the areas and the timeframes that it brings into the sweeping arc of history. But one of the things I also wanted to demonstrate in the book, which is important to what's going on today, is that as, as a geocultural concept of the 20th century, it's become, or it's come to be associated with certain ideas, ideals and values, such as cross-cultural dialogue. It's a story of peace and international cooperation, but it's also a history of dialogue between civilizations. It's also through the histories of Xuanzang or uh, Marco Polo, a story, they become metaphor of cosmopolitanism and dialogue between cultures, regions and, and countries. It's also from the, particularly from the European perspective, a history of East and West dialogue and peaceful interpolity relations. So what I will give you a sense of in the next few minutes is what role those, those themes have played through the course of the 20th century and continue to play um, today within, within this era of regional connectivity. So as a, as a narrative of history, it's often identified or argued that the term was coined by Ferdinand von Richthofen, a German geologist or geographer more broadly, who traveled to Northwest China in the late 18 or in the 1870s who was there to map a potential transcontinental rail line. He was sponsored by a number of organizations, including the German government, because it was a country that was industrializing fast and Northwest China had coal reserves that, um, that European countries needed. As a geographer in the broader sense, he was also interested in histories. Now on his return and taking up an academic position in Europe in, in the mid 1870s, he worked on a publication that was published in 1877, the first volume named China, within which chapter two was called the Silk Route or in its German equivalent. And what this depicted was a history of commodity trade uh, that linked China to uh, 
the, to Europe and particularly um, uh, Medi the Mediterranean region. And it was a history that focused primarily on the two centuries either side of the birth of the Christian era and, and effectively then documented those trade routes that linked Han Dynasty China and the Roman Empire. Now it would be mistaken, would be mistaken to think that that uh, initiated a, a widespread understanding and interest in the Silk Road and, and, and Northwest China or Central Asia in Europe at that time. In fact, it was not until um, 1890 and the, and the uh, transportation of a manuscript to Europe, which has subsequently come to be known as the Bauer Manuscript, that ignited wider interest in this region within European uh, universities and, and academic circles. What that did was trigger a rush of exploration and, and uh, search for antiquities, whether it was manuscripts or archaeological or artistic artifacts, with explorers traveling from uh, Russia, Germany, France, Great Britain, uh, as well as Japan. This has come to be known as a golden age of Silk Road research that came to an end. It was a short window that spanned from around 1890 to the outbreak of World War I. What we can also see is that the ways in which this played out against the backdrop of the great game, a struggle for influence, Russian, uh, sorry, a struggle for influence, control and territorial, territorial control over vast expanses of geography between the Russian Empire and Britain during the mid to late 19th century that carried through until the early 20th century. In those dots in the centre, you can see the sites of uh, where antiquities were uh, discovered and recovered from and the construction of trans-regional and even transcontinental infrastructures in that uh, quest to gain regional control. And I think that offers an interesting parallel to what we're seeing play out today. Now, the Silk Road as a, uh, as a term only entered the public imagination in Europe and North America in the run-up to World War II. Sven Hayden, one of the Swedish explorers that was traveling in that region during that time, was, was one of uh, von Richthofen's students. He was a much popular uh, and widely read uh, author um, and, and enjoyed a certain amount of notoriety in Europe until he became, until he, um, became entangled in the Third Reich in the run up to World War II. But what he did and a number of other uh, projects did during that time, Hollywood was taking up the, uh, the, the story of Marco Polo and, pub and produced a number of films. And Marco Polo became, came to be folded into the Silk Road story. But it's important to remember that Marco Polo didn't travel until 1272. So what we start to see is an arc of history that spans one and a half thousand years that comes to be folded under the Silk Road as a, as a grand story of east-west connectivity. But what that other, uh, what that end grand result shows us is that um, whilst it gained popularity in the run up to World War II, it doesn't really, the Silk Road as a term in the West doesn't really start its pathway towards global fame until the end of the Cold War. So through, the, through those decades between the end of the Second World War and, and, and the early 1990s, histories of global connectivity, East-West peaceful dialogue don't gain much political currency in a geopolitical environment where East and West were, were cleavaged apart and the suspicions uh, of the Soviet Union and the capitalist West. This was also a period, the early 1990s, where Central Asia was also looking to, uh, governments were looking to redirect uh, their foreign policy initiatives and their tourism industries and saw that the Silk Roads was a strategic uh, discourse they could use to position themselves as the crossroads between East and West. We also saw, obviously, the first stages of, of Silk Road tourism during that period. So what we see then, and in this timeline, is the ways in which the Silk Road as a, as a narrative uh, only gains popularity in the West over that period. So if you look at the top there, you'll see a timeline of the early 1970s and the number of publications on the Silk Road during that period that only really begun, begins to prol proliferate at the end of the 1990s and continues to explode right through to today. And these are all Silk Road publications. A lot of these, if not the vast majority, focus on the overland route um, and the traditional way of thinking about the Silk Road that von Richthofen um, constructed in the late 19th century. Central to its uh, popularity at the end of the Cold War was a 10-year project that was led by UNESCO. This was an initiative called Silk Road's Roads of Dialogue. There was an attempt to revive the uh, the east-west connectivities that were broken from the, from the decades uh, after the, in the aftermath of, of World War II. This was about rebuilding trust, international cooperation and, and dialogue. 
This ran from 1988 to 1997, and it was central to the idea of the Silk Road becoming central to um, ideas of peaceful cooperation, intercultural dialogue, and interpolity relations. As part of that project, that initiative, which involved conferences, exhibitions around the world, and multiple media projects, there were also a number of expeditions that were undertaken that involved journalists and scholars traveling for a few weeks through Central Asia and up to a number of months um, on the Maritime Silk Road, as I will explain shortly. So what we see in that in those uh, central uh, routes that you see in the center there, it's a, it's a line that and a route that largely replicates von Richthofen's idea of the Silk Road that travels through and around the Taklamankan Desert from Dunhuang across to, um, to Mediterranean Europe. So this Silk Road Roads of Dialogue project was built and conceived around three principal routes, and I'll come back to that shortly. But what we also see there, one of those routes is the Maritime Silk Road. So the question, the important question is how did that happen? How did we move from a, from a narrow definition of Silk Road histories that spans just the Roman Empire trade with the Han Dynasty China, to a much broader geographical and expansive history that includes maritime connectivities, linking the Mediterranean right across to Nara in Japan. To answer that question, we need to go back to the 1950s. I'm sure many of you in Singapore are very familiar with the Bandung uh, meeting uh, of 1955, which gave birth to the, the non-aligned movement, bringing African and Asian leaders together. But what has also happened, but has mu received much less academic and, and public interest, was a meeting that happened in Tokyo in the following year, where a number of the Asian leaders got together and invited UNESCO as a, as an, and encouraged them to think of an initiative that would develop East-West relations that was another East-West beyond the geopolitical East-West of the Cold War. UNESCO duly went back to Paris and conceived a project that was formally titled the East-West Major Project on the Mutual Appreciation of Eastern and Western Cultural Values. This highly ambitious project ran from 1957 to 1966 and it included themes around religion, art, folklore, music, craft, literature and archaeology. Now this was, uh, as I say, this was conceived in, in 1957 and as part of Japan's contribution the Japanese National Commission for UNESCO organized a couple of workshops, one in Kyoto in, in Tokyo in 1957 during that same year. In the run-up to, uh, to those events, a report was produced that drew on the idea of, of uh, von Richthofen's Silk Road, but very much wanted to expand the themes. And I'll come back to the ways in which that happened shortly, because it's essential to the ways in which this triangular notion of the Silk Road expands over the coming decades. But for the moment, it's important to note that this, this project of the late 1950s, these workshops, began a path of increased interest in, in the Silk Road in Japan, one of the few countries that had interest in it, where, the, where, the, where a moment where the rest of the world was largely uninterested in this history of East-West connectivity. The first Olympics was held in Tokyo, first Asian Olympics was held in Tokyo in 1964. Since 1936, the flame that travels that leaves Greece in the run-up to any Olympic event, leaves Greece and travels to the destination. And in 1964, the flame uh, followed, and I quote, a route that was branded as an international relay along the Southern Silk Road. The flame traveled through Turkey, Iran, Pakistan, India, Malaysia, Thailand, and other places. And for those countries where it was unable to be traveled, where it was allowed to be carried by foot, Japan Airlines developed a particular technology to allow the flame to be carried on board and skip over those more diplomatically and politically uh, difficult places, as you see on the right. The two images you see in the center there relate to an important moment that took place, in, an important event that took place in um, 1972. Shortly after uh, Nixon visits Mao in China in that era, in that year, um, Kakue Tanaka, the Japanese Prime Minister, visits uh, Mao in Peking as well, and takes along the NHK uh, Broadcasting Corporation, the National Broadcaster of Japan. There it is proposed that a collaboration between CCTV and NHK should produce a Silk Road documentary to document the ways in which China and Japan were connected historically and as a single civilizational zone and in peaceful times and a cultural zone that predates the horrific events of the 20th century. <clears throat> 
This ends up being broadcast in 1979 in Japan and around the world or 30 plus countries to widespread acclaim and is still regarded as a definitive Silk Road uh, historical series. Japanese media companies, NHK and others, also take up other Silk Road projects as well to, 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 in an attempt to revive Sino-Japanese relations during that period. One of the most uh, interesting ones was the story of Monkey, as it was uh, the children's television um, uh, series that ran for a number of years, which depicted one of the most celebrated works of Chinese literature, Journey to the West, which is attributed to the 16th century author Wu Cheng En. Now, this also led, uh, this interest in the Silk Road in, the, in Japan in the 1970s and 80s also led to a, an extraordinary exhibition that took place in Nara in 1988, which was a celebration of, of Silk Road civilizations. This is the same year that, Chi that UNESCO launched its uh, Roads of Dialogue project. And you see here again, these three routes, the Oasis and Step route, the route of Buddhist art and the Sea, sea route. Now, again, the question uh, uh, is, how did the sea route come about? And interestingly, if you look at the uh, publications that were produced for that conference, uh, sorry, for that exhibition, um, they document the sea route through a story of uh, connections between Syria and Japan. A number of Japanese archaeologists during the 1980s were doing underwater archaeology off the Syrian coast. And this becomes a diplomatic vehicle for, for, China, for Japanese and Syrian uh, collaborations possibly an unthinkable um, association given the events of, of today, given the events of, that have happened in Syria and, and the region more widely in the last few years. But the question is, where does this sea route come from? So let's go back to that 1957 report. Here we start to see the origins of that uh, triangular notion of the sea, Silk Route and how it becomes dramatically expanded beyond, beyond uh, von Richthofen's idea of an east-west corridor. In, the, in this publication, this 1957 publication that ran up to these two initial workshops that happened in Kyoto and Tokyo, Japanese authors of that period that, that came together to produce this document argued that Japanese uh, scholarship from the early 20th century represented a much greater understanding of the pre-modern connectivities of the, across Asia um, than Western scholars understood during that period. So this report very much drew on the uh, scholarship of that early 1910s, 1920s period um, from uh, Japan's universities. And in that respect, the, the Oasis route that very much maps onto um, von Richthofen's uh, uh, east-west understanding of, of pre-modern connections was complemented by the idea of a step route, which brought in uh, Mongol histories and other north-south um, uh, forms of pre-modern connectivity, trade, exchange, and technological diffusion. And this is where we see the crucial introduction of the sea route, the 1957 report. And here, again, this report drew on early 20th century scholarship that, that uh, documented um, the connections that Japan had with Southeast Asia. These were very schematic and they are somewhat um, uh, um, uh, architectural in their scale, but they, but they begin to paint a picture of the, of the types of uh, histories that we are studying today in much, much greater detail. But of course, this scholarship of the early 20th century was taking place within, a, taking place within the context of Japanese colonialism of the Korean Peninsula. So these Japanese scholars were very much um, uh, wanting to demonstrate that Nara was the place in Asia where Buddhism reached its fullest expression within the region. But they were also very much interested in constructing a civilizational zone that connected uh, Japan and cities such as Nara, both with the Korean Peninsula China and beyond down into uh, South, South, uh, uh, South Asia in particular and right down to Sri Lanka. Um, this is this, this type of Pan-Asianism which became uh, central to Pan-Asianist movements in the, uh, in the early decades of the 20th century was also co-opted by both the right and the left in Japan in the run-up to the Second World War. Now, one of those locations where this was um, uh, uh, the evidence of this civilizational zone was, was could be seen was in the, in the area of Gyeongju in southern Korea today. And so Japanese scholars were encouraged uh, to undertake research there. And some of the funding for their project was given by the South Manchurian Railway Company, in, along which was constructing railway lines along the Korean peninsula. Uh, 
Um, and this was a project to encourage tourism and other forms of settlement by Japanese along the Korean Peninsula, down the Korean Peninsula during this period. Now, if we return to the 1980s, we start to see some circles appearing, historical circles appearing. The Maritime Silk Road, as I mentioned, this was an expedition of, of one of the uh, trips for this Roads in Dialogue project that was led by UNESCO. It was a 154 day expedition that was undertaken on the Fulk al, al Salama, which is translated as the Ship of Peace, which was the sole military vessel of the Amman Navy. The Sultan of Amman donated his, this, this ship to uh, the United Nations and uh, to, to lead this voyage across, it started from Venice, traveled through the Suez Canal, flying the flag of the United Nations, and eventually traveling up to uh, Hakata and, and um, East Asia six months later. On board were a number of scholars and journalists from the New York Times, from the BBC, who documented maritime histories with a number of lectures and stories focusing on the, voyage, the seven voyages of Zheng He across the Indian Ocean. And it's interesting, why would the Sultan of Amman doing this? So this took place in 1991, the, the moment of the first uh, Gulf War with Iraq invading Kuwait and the US response. Uh, Amman very much wanted to demonstrate its position on the international stage and be a friend of the international community. So the Silk Road offered a, 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 nice, a neat platform for, as a, and a vehicle to do that. Um, and what also we see happening in that period, that the, 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 the Sultan, the, the, uh, the, the Fulk al Salama travels to East Asia and visits uh, the city of Gyeongju and the, and the researchers and the journalists get off and they um, visit that temple site that I in indicated a few minutes ago. And the documentation there and the history that was being celebrated was the kingdom of Sheila and its connections to the uh, treasures of Nara. So why was this significant at that moment? Well, if you think about the, the ongoing troubles of the Korean Peninsula, the end of the Cold War offered an opportunity where the organizations like UNESCO and the broader UN agencies hoped there'd be some way of uh, resolving the, the conflict in that and the ongoing standoffs of that region. So the idea of a peaceful unified uh, kingdom um, historically and a wider cultural zone that connects Japan, China and, and uh, Korea was a history they wanted, wanted to put out there and promote as a, as an, in an attempt to fix the tensions of that moment and, and in that region. Now that maritime histories of the Silk Road very much disappears again from the international stage, primarily because in the 1990s and the early 2000s, we get the events of uh, 2001. So the Silk Road story and its international currency gravitates back to Central Asia. On the events of 9-11, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, um, and the republics of Central Asia are all sources of suspicion for the West and particularly for the US in terms of the fundamentalist Islam that was um, uh, seen to be um, fermenting there. And so in 2002, um, the pictures you see in the bottom left and on the right depict a, uh, a Silk Roads festival that was put on by the Smithsonian Institute in an attempt to uh, diffuse the, the representations of and soften the representations of Central Asia and celebrate the histories of Islam and, and this region as a, as a cosmopolitan history, as a history of dialogue and peaceful cooperation. So again, we see the diplomatic resonances that the Silk Road was, um, was that afforded, that the Silk Road afforded during these uh, highly uh, uh, significant moments. What we also saw during that period, during the 1990s and 2000s, was the emergence of the Silk Road as a foreign policy strategy. Um, we saw that from China, um, Japan, Korea, and also the United States. This new Silk Roads project report that was written by Frederick Starr, um, and it was eventually taken up by um, um, Hillary Clinton during the Obama administration, but it was initially blocked by Congress in terms of its funding, offered a model for uh, winning hearts and minds in Central Asia through Pakistan, Afghanistan, and transboundary infrastructure as a mechanism to do that. If you look at that report, you'll see it's very much a template for the Belt and Road Initiative today, interestingly. But what we've also seen in the last few years is uh, the rise of the Indian Ocean become a multipolar region and a geopolitically sensitive area. Uh, with a decline of the influence in the, of the United States in the region, we're seeing India and China exercising their power and, uh, and uh, um, diplomatic gestures in the region and military gestures. Um, and this, is, this geopolitical shift is also giving rise to geocultural histories as we've seen. Now, 
maritime diplomacy has been a, a, a tool of Chinese diplomacy for a number of years. It predates these, these, this rise of the interest in the Indian Ocean. So it's been in place within Japanese political discourse, sorry, Chinese political discourse for around 20, 25 years, and then focused often on the figure of Zhang He. But since the launch of Belt and Road, what we've seen is a, a dramatic acceleration of this celebration and this history of maritime Silk Road um, as a region of connectivity and peaceful connectivity. We are seeing museums opening in China around maritime histories and, and temporary exhibitions and permanent exhibitions on the maritime Silk Road emerging. We're also seeing this phenomena emerge around the region, and I'm sure many of you in Singapore will recognize these two slides of the museum that, that is um, uh, telling the story of the Maritime Silk Road and uh, connecting to the histories of grand travelers, including Zhang He's voyages um, to East Africa. But in the era of Belt and Road, we're also seeing a dramatic increase in cultural sector cooperation around maritime archaeology. Here's an example of one of those projects um, linking China and Sri Lanka in the search for evidence of Zhang He's voyages um, uh, that uh, took place in the last few years, involving collaborations over museum uh, uh, without any artifacts that were found that would be displayed in museums both in China and Sri Lanka. One of the things I've argued in the book is that these cultural sector collaborations of Belt and Road that come under that umbrella and celebrating the history of the Silk Road are also converging with the wider agendas of BRI infrastructure development. So those two grey circles illustrate where maritime archaeology in Sri Lanka and in the, on the left in Kenya converge and over, overlay um, the wider agendas of Belt and Road in terms of infrastructure, whether it's ports, rail, highways or uh, uh, um, mega city developments. And there are other examples um, that have, uh, show this pattern that have documented um, in the last few years. What we've also seen more recently is the Maritime Silk Road become an umbrella and a, and a term by which we're understanding and framing World Heritage nominations that celebrate maritime histories. This is th that, uh, those slides there uh, are in involved the, the, the nomination of a city of Chuanzhou in southern China which has been framed in part as a, as a maritime Silk Road nomination, um, but also uh, China's connection to Southeast Asia more broadly. So what I'm getting at here and what I'm uh, showing and demonstrating that what we're seeing is um, the maritime Silk Road stabilizing and normalizing um, as, a, uh, as a representation of history and a term that um, is being stabilized and un uncritically accepted as fact. What are the implications of this? Well, um, one of the things I think it's far from a stable history, and one of the things I, I've hopefully, hopefully demonstrated in, in, in the previous 10 minutes or so, is that the Maritime Silk Road as a story of regional connectivity has been shaped by particular events and historical processes that have taken place over the 20th century. It's anything but stable. It's a narrative that continues to evolve and mutate. When Japan was driving the agenda, places such as Nara and Kyongju were given prominence and visibility and became part of the, Silk Road Mar the maritime Silk Road history. At the end of the Cold War, Oman featured heavily because of the international relations landscape of that moment and the role in which Oman wanted to play therein. But now in the age of Belt and Road, we're seeing the maritime Silk Road expand and travel as far as Greece for tourism purposes. It features countries such as Kenya, Sri Lanka, and Tunisia, as I've documented in some other publications. But interestingly and importantly, it also excludes others, most notably Japan, for the geopolitical reasons which I think you might be able to anticipate. But we are also seeing this, this history being driven by one country, China. Potentially that's a positive development. Asia's maritime histories have not been given the international visibility that they warrant. In Western accounts of world history, the Indian Ocean region has been widely overlooked until the Portuguese entered the, re the Indian Ocean in 1500. It doesn't feature in any world history predating that, that, that 1500 period. So one of the things I've tried to argue in the book is that Belt and Road has created a political economy for a whole new way of imagining, displaying and writing the cultures and histories of Eurasia. And in that respect, it opens up exciting possibilities. But in today's maritime heritage discourses, we are also seeing the pacification of history as episodes of conflict, imperial ambition, bloodshed, and other difficult histories are all excised from the record. 
there are inconveniences to the diplomatic and trade imperatives of the architectures of regional connectivity, whether it's Belt and Road or others. So Belt and Road has propelled us into a new era in the political use of maritime paths, as we saw last week with India and Indonesia responding. Through the Maritime Silk Road, a romanticized depiction of regional exchange and peace, trade and intercultural dialogue is emerging. We are seeing complex pasts being distilled and contrived for both public consumption and for strategic deployment. It is a process that fascinatingly combines and constructs history as both a national patrimony and as a shared heritage. And it's that very combination that allows maritime past to be powerfully activated within the geopolitical ambitions of connectivity to today, of today. The examples I've shown here suggest that we need to look more carefully at these new histories that are being written both in the corridors of academia and museums and in the public imagination. Are they privileging certain periods, countries, themes or heroes and simultaneously ignoring other peoples, regions and events? But what does it mean for a history to be Eurocentric, Sinocentric or even land centric? In brief, I would suggest that it means privileging certain histories, certain events and certain people. It also means framing those histories in certain ways telling particular stories and not others, writing and rewriting the past for particular purposes. In the case that we're seeing today, that's Belt and Road. And it's not just China that's driving this, the partners of Belt and Road are willingly buying into this representation of history to suggest that they were friends 700 years ago and they will be friends in the 21st century. But this also means that we are seeing the writing of histories in ways that create hierarchies of culture and the past. Ideas about of civilization or past are also accompanied about of ideas about the barbarian other. And I think in a complex geopolitical landscape to today, that that's a source of worry that we need to look to in to the future. But I also need to think, think we also need to look at the ways in which the crafting of continental civilizational histories also speaks to cultural claims over regions. In the example I gave right at the beginning, Europeans were undertaking this in the Levant the regions of the Bible and the biblical archaeology. This region was seen as the roots of European civilization to which Britain and France claimed that they were the rightful and natural heirs. But, all, but what I think we are seeing today, these issues that become concealed, hidden, uh, hidden away once narratives become normalized, once they become stable and circulate in both scholarship and popular culture and receive little critical attention. And I think we are seeing that happen today in the context of maritime secret. And there are powerful political and economic forces driving that. I've given you some examples of Belt and Road cultural projects, but there are many others that you could draw on. But there are other processes too, that, where the maritime secret is becoming normalized, processes that give it legitimacy and prestige. So what we saw last year was a, the National Geographic uh, Channel um, put out a maritime secret reborn uh, documentary, which I'm guessing some of you have seen, which reproduces some of these ideas uh, of this peaceful uh, region of connectivity that straddles centuries that's being revived for the 21st century. Channel News Asia in Singapore has done, made a number of similar also uh, short documentaries that advance these ideas, as has the BBC. One project in particular, I think is particularly important. There was also a report that was published last year is promoting uh, maritime Silk Road cruise ship tourism and other forms of regional tourism put out by the World Tourism Organization. If you extract the locations that the, that the report identifies, the cruise ship locations identified in blue and the heritage sites in yellow speak of a regional uh, maritime Silk Road tourism industry that a number of countries will willingly buy into over the coming years, depending on what happens with COVID. This has enormous consequences for both uh, at the regional scale and for individual locations. Here's an example of Malacca, which is a uh, critical uh, site within the Belt and Road infrastructure connectivity in the Malacca Gateway project. That is also one of the places where the Maritime Silk Road history is gravitating and, and in particular the history of, of Zhang He or Cheng Ho. But beyond these uh, uh, infrastructure projects and the ways in which it's circulating in popular culture, what we're also seeing is the Maritime Silk Road stabilized within academia and within scholarship. And I think that needs to be looked at as well. Here you see two, um, uh, two publications within political science or political geography 
which speak to these um, these associations of the Silk Road and including the Maritime Silk that I identified earlier in terms of peace, connectivity and uh, dialogue and so on and so forth. So I will essentially wrap up there and because I think also these, these trends that we're seeing also enter into archaeology. And so I think the conference next week will raise some interesting questions and the parallels in terms of the ways in which scholars and cultural institutions can think about how they position themselves in relation to these powerful forces around maritime paths that are, that are unfolding today. Thank you, and I hand back to Stephen. Uh, thank you very much, Tim, for yeah, a really uh, fantastic, really comprehensive uh, run through of uh, uh, what what the Maritime Silk Road is, or or what 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 it, the multiple sort of possibilities of what it is and, and the multiple histories of it. I, I guess I was struck, you know, by, by the many different uh, interpretations of it. I guess these days we do very much think of it as a sort of a China focused phenomenon and they are obviously definitely driving it as you've shown, but, but of course, like you, you pointed out by going through the history of it, uh, maybe people are familiar with it, uh, the European involvement, but I was quite interested. I, I was not familiar with, for example, that then Japan, took up that sort of uh, torch, almost literally, you know, and, and so it's quite interesting how over time different uh, nation states or different geopolitical situations have led to different players uh, mm. being involved and sort of defining what uh, the, maritime, the Maritime Silk Road or the Silk Roads in general are. So thank you for that. Um, on that note, uh, Marina, would you like to respond to Tim's uh, talk? Yeah, thank you very much uh, again, Stephen, for giving me the opportunity to be part of uh, this really fascinating conversation and to hear Tim talk about um, the history of the Silk Road and the Maritime Silk Road, uh, fascinating topics that he has also, as he mentioned, developed in, in much of his work. Um, I will for the sake of time, I will not summarize extensively his talk the way he did with mine, um, because I know we're uh, very short on time. So maybe what I will do instead is just pose the first questions for him so that we can open up for a discussion. Um, one of the things that uh, was fascinating in, in the story... Lost my pen. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's obviously worried, you know, he has to write this question he has down. To write he's... the questions. He thinks it's a five-part question. It's God. No, it's, it's only going to be a three-part question. I'm, I'm, I live in Singapore and I know <laughs> the rule of three. <laughs> ready, three? Two at best. <laughs> okay, so, so are you ready? Sure. Um, yeah. So one of the fascinating things about your work, Tim, that I really appreciate is that you give it a lot of historical context. Um, and it, it was, as Stephen mentioned, it was nice to hear about Japan and, and Oman and now kind of the baton is passed on to China. Um, although it seems that you're a little more uh, ambiguous about what, the, what it means uh, because uh, China particularly connects the maritime Silk Road and the Silk Road in general to uh, their geopolitical ambitions. But um, the actor uh, that was left out um, or only mentioned briefly, uh, but everybody cares about that actor is UNESCO. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit more about how do you understand uh, the trajectory of UNESCO over this fascinating course of many years? Because they seem to have been a major player and they still are a very major player in that. So that, that will be my first question to you. The second one is, again, uh, looking at your uh, kind of historical overview of this, I really liked how you pointed to certain uh, critical events in history. So you talked about the Cold War. Uh, well, we can even go further back, but, but you did talk about the Cold War. You talked about 9-11, um, 2001. Uh, which were uh, sort of major global shifts. Um, do you think that COVID will be another major global shift like that? And what would that mean for the Silk Road overall, where the narrative of the Silk Road is about connectivity and whether we are talking land or maritime, um, it's still um, 
sort of the same issue. How does connectivity um, happen uh, in, in this day and age of COVID? And my last question uh, will be uh, to take you a little bit back to what you started with. So you started with toppling of um, different statues, uh, which is pretty much statues of uh, European uh, colonial figures for the most part. Um, and you did talk about uh, the Silk Road being, in a sense, a, a sort of a, a, a way to pacify history or to give a sense of history that is um, driven by other interests. Well, if we look at these statues and the reason why they're being toppled, you, we can talk about other projects, European projects of pacifying history or creating a narrative of history that um, that is now becoming problematic. So, so how do you square the Silk Road vis-a-vis -vis the European type of narratives that we have lived with for centuries? So I'll stop here. Thanks. If I, if I respond to those now, Stephen. Yes, please. I think that would be good. Yeah. Um, your first question was very much where does UNESCO sit in this um, this uh, process today? Um, they've got a challenging task. There are very powerful forces at play, as I've as I've identified um, from a number of uh, national actors. But I think uh, and UNESCO is very uh, used to that, so there's nothing new there. But what I think um, what we're seeing is an interesting space open up for um, new forms of collaboration and cooperation. Um, that UNESCO can hopefully shepherd around these uh, histories of, of uh, maritime connectivity that move us beyond the nation state and the national, um, which has dominated um, the representation of heritage in Asia in the last few decades. So there are many stories to tell. And, we, and, and you identified that last week in terms of uh, spice histories, um, uh, uh, other types of histories, whether it's all different forms of trade that bring in other regions um, that connect Southeast Asia to East Africa. Um, and it also tells stories that um, are not so familiar within the public imagination. Um, and I think that's a very healthy thing, um, but, it's a, it, but it's gonna be a long haul. It's gonna be a complicated process. Um, often, as I mentioned last week, it's shaped by where the funding comes from and where it goes. So I think that's an important. UNESCO is, is um, uh, uh, not as rich as many people uh, often think, and it certainly doesn't have an army as some people think. So it's gonna, it's gonna be embattled in ways that it needs to um, uh, uh, maneuver in a diplomatic way that brings these different uh, actors together in, in what can be a very, very productive way. And in a way that kind of speaks to your third question. So I'll jump to that. Um, and that's that, yes, that European uh, history, historiography has framed, uh, uh, Asia in certain ways um, and I think the maritime speaks to that in a really really important way and, and, uh, and as I mentioned um, the importance of both uh, the Indian Ocean and Central Asia don't really figure into uh, world history in the way that they should. Um, so the connections between East Africa um, and countries such as Iran today that um, don't really get any recognition and there's possibilities that those, um, those sort of deeper histories of of trade and, and connectivity can can be explored and given visibility. Um, so uh, so yes, there are, uh, there are ways in which uh, uh, these this there's there's a new political logic for giving visibility to the histories. But your your question was framed around uh, the idea of statues and the role they might play in material culture more broadly, whether it's museum collections or artifacts or, or buildings, or, or even, as I say, uh, statues that are built for particular purposes. The statue is a problematic way to commemorate history, I think. It ce celebrates heroes, and that's often a very narrow way and a very often a male-dominated way of thinking about history. Um, the issue of Gandhi opens up the complexities of that, of someone who has a complicated life, of their thinking, develops and evolves, but they get framed by particular moments um, and, and Gandhi's experiences in South Africa and his potentially racist interviews that were, um, uh, that he um, uh, offered during that period, that now become a source of attention. Um, and uh, so I think there's some innovative ways and, and that's where the digital comes in, right? That's where the, we can explore all sorts of fascinating ways to capture these, these other histories in, in um, in new ways that get us out of these traps of thinking about monumental histories or, or um, monumentalizing history in those ways. 
Your second question uh, asked was focused on COVID. Um, I think that's a fascinating issue. Um, and, uh, and obviously it's, it's uh, had a dramatic impact on uh, the tourism industry in Asia, um, which was one of the key components of the Silk Road um, phenomena that was growing. And with China now 150 million pre-COVID numbers, 150 million Chinese tourists coming out of, of the country, uh, that um, many of them traveling to Southeast Asia and uh, other parts of the region. Um, and often visiting now and thinking about their trips framed in terms of um, Silk Road histories. And I would suggest that China is encouraging that and, and constructing a, the idea of, a, of the Chinese population now as inheriting a, a lot, much larger geocultural history of which China sits in the middle um, and the revival of, in that sense, of the Middle Kingdom. But COVID also reveals an interesting phenomenon. There were five pillars that were identified in 2015 of Belt and Road. Um, and infrastructure, trade, finance, so on and so forth. But the one that often gets ne neglected was people to people connectivities. What COVID has showed us is that globalization, everything falls over once people to people connectivities can't happen. Borders close, trade collapses, economies collapse, so on and so forth. It's extraordinary how um, this has happened in such a short period. And I think particularly in academia and more broadly within policy, this people to people connectivity is, um, is, uh, has not been understood that well. We don't have a particularly good way of thinking about it, I think. Um, and in, I think one of the implications of COVID is that it's going to uh, um, encourage forms of isolationism, um, potentially forms of xenophobia as nationalist populist movements um, uh, consolidate their power within closed borders and reopening borders um, encouraging new forms of people to people connectivity is really important. I think that could be the long term um, dark side of COVID is that um, th this takes us into a new complex geopolitical space. And I think um, re-establishing people-to-people uh, -people connections and rebuilding those, those forms um, uh, is really important. And if the Maritime Silk Road is a form of uh, cultural dialogue can encourage that and it pr provides the mechanisms which I sort of documented in, a, in the wake of World War II and the Cold War, then I think that's the way in which we might be able to think about it going forward um, in the future. So I think that's a, you know, that's a, a a potentially very, very productive um, space that the Maritime Silk Road can occupy. Thanks, Tim, for those very comprehensive answers again. Um, I just wonder if anybody in the audience has any questions for Tim. I, I saw somebody raise their hand at one point. Okay, there's one from Horst Lieber. Can you read it, Tim, or you want me to read it? I do, yes. Classification right. of history. So the question is about, for those who can't read it, is about the, um, uh, I'll do your job for you, right, Stephen? It's just, Thanks, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it, the question is about the pacification and the rewriting of history by whom? Um, isn't it our task to produce unbiased histories um, and, uh, and properly reflect um, news sources um, and, uh, um, in, and the ways in which we might be thinking about how narratives are being fashioned? I think that's very much true, and and and, as, and hopefully what I try to show is that um, there's a there's a in the, in popular culture um, there are there are forces at play that that shape the ways in which history comes to rep be represented. A narrative is everything, and so um, so the ways in which particular events get focused and people and uh, and particular ways in which those events get represented is a, is something we need to pay attention to, um, and uh, and I think that's one of the challenges. Um, of the uh, of the coming future the next question speaks to that exact issue um the next question was about what what if we have would have called it the slave route instead of the silk road i mean obviously not a great deal of silk traveled on the maritime silk road it's extremely unhelpful terminology um if anything it should be the ceramic route but in that respect um no commodity really captures the complexities of pre-modern connectivities and pre-european encounters across across the region so yes it's uh, gravitating towards one particular term, theme, or or or, or, uh, or commodity opens up a, a number of difficult questions. I think. Okay, actually, we have a question. Uh, Charlie B raised their hand. Do you want to un see if they can unmute them if they want to ask a question? Oops, sorry. Hi. Oh, hi. Yep. Hi, my name is Charlie. I'm based in Singapore. Thanks for that uh, excellent uh, briefing. Um, I'd be curious of your uh, analysis of the risk of uh, the histories being written, particularly by China, but also by others, and how um, 
how is it, is it dangerous? Is this normal? Does uh, the academic community need to study these things um, and take risks to challenge these narratives, even if that risk means hurting their chances of getting further funding? And is there actual physical risk to evidence that um, is counter to the narrative that they're pushing? Thank you. Thanks, Terry. If I understand your question correctly, Charlie, you kind of suggested that is there a risk to both people and the material culture um, in, in your second question, in your second part of your question. But yeah, I, I would say um, there's, well, you are, I guess you identified risk in a number of ways. And I think that's a really good way of putting it. Um, yes, there's, uh, I think um, we are in a complex uh, national and international space now, the geopolitical rivalries that we're seeing in different regions. Um, it's far more complicated than the Western media portrays in terms of US-China tensions. Um, we've got an, an India that's nervous about an expansionist and an ambitious China. We've also got countries further afield in, in uh, such as Iran and Turkey that are very much looking to um, uh, use their uh, nostalgic past and um, Erdogan's neo-Ottomanism is also um, playing a role in that part of the world. So these, this use of history um, for both legitimizing, uh, both domestically and forming uh, allies and friendships outside uh, national boundaries is a new complicated space, I think, that we need to pay attention to. Um, and, and the ways in which that draws both researchers, institutions, and the, even the, the artifacts is, um, is actually quite important. Yeah, I think there's, there are risks of those. And I think it's um, incumbent upon uh, those involved. And I, hopefully that's what I've tried to communicate today, that. Um, that it's not a, a case of burying your head in the sand and ignoring these issues. I think there's reasons to pay attention to these developments. Thanks. Uh, we have a few more questions we can take. Uh, so one from Chen, who thanks you for the fascinating talk. Thank you, Chen. A uh, question for Tim. The overland route of Silk Road's Chang, uh, Chang as an, sorry, sorry, Chang'an as a Tianqin corridor was inscribed mm. as a World Heritage Site. It is a joint project China, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan. Actually, you, you've written about this, Tim. Uh, do you think it's possible that joint efforts would be invested by China, Southeast Asian countries to nominate maritime silk roads for world heritage? Yeah, good question. Absolutely. And something I'd be quite interested to hear. Uh, watch this space, I would say. It's a, it's a sensitive and difficult uh, issue, but I think, yes, there is definitely a lot of interest in this. Um, so yes, I think that's something we will see in the next few years, but that, um, uh, the best way I can answer that is that uh, that um, Tianqin Corridor, that is the first World Heritage nomination that got a world, first Silk Road Corridor that became a World Heritage site, is one of the many that, for the overland Silk Road that is in the pipeline, there's others in the pipeline too that stretch down to South Asia and, and other regions. And they are based on a very extensive report that was put together um, by Tim Williams at UCL in London, who identified, I think it was 83 potential corridors um, for uh, overland Silk Road World Heritage listings. Um, and these brought together, you know, ostensibly transboundary uh, uh, nominations that brought together a um, uh, number of countries. And it's important to remember that in the, in the wake of uh, the devastation of World War II, UNESCO was established to, to uh, uh, foster forms of international cooperation around education, science and culture. So this collaboration between countries uh, on Silk Road World Heritage nominations is, is a good thing and it's a productive uh, set of developments. And, um, and I think what we need now is a, is a, there is no equivalent document for the Maritime Silk Road and, um, and there's um, a work in progress towards that around how we have a, a parallel document that identifies how we think about maritime histories across the region that kind of give a, a, a more robust uh, a depiction of, of this complex history. Thanks, Tim. Um, another question from AJ. I think I'll phrase it a bit more wider because it's something I, that, that actually I was thinking about as well when I when I was uh, listening to your talk. Um, it seems like the the Maritime Silk Road or these these type of imagined uh, maybe imagined civilizational zones, if we can call them that, they you've done a very good job of showing that they have um, a lot of potential. But then, of course, there's also pitfalls as well. And, and I, I can see where AJ's question is coming from in terms of uh, China being the more dominant uh, uh, 
author, I guess, in this narrative at present. I mean, I guess we're already, Marina's talk last week sort of showed some of the resistance that's coming up to it. Um, but, you know, if you look back, your talk showed, of course, as well, that at, at one point Japan was using this for its own um, political motives in terms of vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Korea and so forth. So, so you know, this is what, what China is doing right now is, is nothing new. And of course, the Europeans, mm -hmm. I think we're doing it as well. So, so maybe you could address it in a broader sense. Um, how, where, where does the balance lie? Where does the tension and co contestation lie within, you know, within this, this concept of, of maritime Silk Road? Yeah, and again, I think that's, a, that's an interesting question, and it's a, it's a highly complicated question um, to answer in terms of how it will play mm. out over, over the coming years. I mean, Sri Lanka is an interesting case where, um, I mean, the Belt and Road Initiative is is subject to elect, electoral politics around the region, so governments come and go, and um, and in that respect, some are pro-China, some are less pro-China, and some are very anti-China, and um, and so the, the the willingness of certain governments, and then and then uh, institutions within the country to buy into this uh, project is, is is varying and it changes over time. Um, and of course, um, the, the role of the overseas Chinese plays a role, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia. Um, and and the, the ways in which histories in particular, someone uh, to give it the Chinese pronunciation of Zhang He is understood differently in Malaysia and Indonesia, for example, um, and how that figures into um, the types of projects that can be uh, activated within Belt and Road cooperation, um, and yes, it will. It, it's it's a. I think it's a. It's a. It's a topic of fifty PhDs and over the coming years to think about how this will unfold and and also um, and the risks it poses. Um, and uh, one of the PhD candidates I'm working with is looking at you know the possibilities, the ways in which. Um, this is now um, encouraging and potentially encouraging new forms of illicit trafficking of antiquities from Southeast Asia to maritime artifacts to China um, as there's a growing interest in these histories. Um, so that, I guess, also speaks to the question of Charlie around risk, right? And, and, um, and, uh, um, and, uh, and the uh, widespread uh, interest in maritime histories means we're going to see a dramatic increase, I think, of collecting both institutionally and privately in countries such as China um, and Southeast Asia needs to kind of think about that. Mm, that's a very interesting point, and I guess very pertinent for myself in particular and my colleagues at the museum. I guess in one way we've pivoted in terms of our Asian export art is, is one way we've been collecting in that area. But, but of course, um, as you say, it, it can also um, encourage illicit trade um, and, and, you know, in its sort of different area. Um, I think we're almost out of time. I think from Ewan's question, uh, to what extent can we quantify the amount of materials that pass through the Maritime Silk Road, ceramics and tea. Maybe we'll leave that till next week. It seems like a lot of the, yeah, I don't think Tim is a material cultures guy per se. Um, so yeah, you and if you can hopefully make the conference, uh, there'll be quite a few panels, uh, one panel in particular on that um, from Amir, given the narrative fluidity, um, how do you see opportunities for exploration highlighting of non-colonial uh, I think, yeah, we touched on that a bit last week as well. I think what I'd like to do maybe is just give uh, Marina one last chance if she wants to hmm. make a concluding remark or, and, and then I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you everybody for your questions though. Yeah, I just um, was able to unmute myself, which is a good thing. Um, well, what I, I can perhaps on the ad is that um, the field of maritime Silk Road and the Silk Road in general is, is a very complex one. And um, we have to thank uh, Stephen for giving us an opportunity to bring the conversation about the Silk Road to the museum, which is, a, a, as, as I tried to say last week, an extremely important space of how the histories are crafted. Uh, and what narratives we have. So I think we all have a, a very big agenda on, on our hands to continue questioning um, the narratives that are, are created. And at the same time, I completely agree with Tim that um, preserving a sense of, of connectivity is very important in this day and age. Um, yes, it, it has its challenges, but um, the uh, alternative is, is rather grim. Hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, on that note, well, to try and, try and end on an optimistic note, but 